In today's video, I'm going to paint a miniature portrait of my husband, but not a traditional miniature portrait, a lover's eye portrait. Before I tell you what a lover's eye portrait is first, I will start by setting myself up to paint the portrait and I'll show you what I do. What I have to do is make a cylindrical shape that will encompass the eye that I'm painting. This is the piece that I'm going to put the eye into. And again, I'll explain to you why it would go into this. It's like a piece of jewelry. Once I start painting, I'll tell you the little story about what a lover's eye portrait is. This particular oval, I'm not gonna draw that with my hands. So what I have is, again, from my old graphic days, I have a template that has ellipses. And as you can see, you can fit them all different sizes. But the size that I want to fit within the frame of this is this particular size, which is a 35 degree ellipse. This is what I'm gonna be working with. I'm gonna take my X-Acto knife and I'm just going to cut out this square. That's where the eye's going. That is going to fit into here, and hopefully it'll come out the way that we're hoping it will. I'm going to isolate the eye that I want to use when I first begin to draw, and I'm going to use this one, even though this is the size. Between the two of them, I'll figure it out, and then I'll use this size for absolute detail when it comes time to paint. So let me begin and then I'll start telling you about what a lover's eye is. In the days before the first photograph, miniature portraits were a way for someone to carry with them an image of a loved one. Miniature portraits were traditionally painted in watercolor on thin sheets of ivory or gouache on cardstock. If you've never heard of lover's eye portraits before, they were a short-lived portrait trend that was popular for only 40 years from the 1780s through the 1820s, where only the eye of a loved one was painted. These were usually commissioned for sentimental reasons and were often worn as bracelets, brooches, pendants, and even painted small enough to wear as a ring. They were sometimes placed in decorative frames and were always carried by the recipient as a love token. But why just the eye? Why not the whole face of a lover? There were two reasons. First, for anonymity. The eye would be recognizable only by the recipient and could then be worn publicly, keeping his or her lover's identity a secret. Second, because the eyes are considered the window to the soul. And what could be more of a connection to a lover's soul than their very intimate, loving gaze? But in the 18th and 19th centuries, social codes limited public interaction between people of the opposite sex. In the stifling atmosphere, a look was much more easily exchanged than words, and different types of glances could convey various emotions and even as private messages. Eye miniatures thrived in this environment, where even the subtlest glance could convey love or lust. These were looks and expressions we today would hardly take notice of. They would sometimes contain locks of hair gifted from the sitter to further accentuate the sentimentality of the piece. Although the lover's eye portraits had already been seen in France, the trend came fully into fashion in England around the 1780s. When the Prince of Wales and future King George IV was having an affair with a Catholic widow named Maria Anne Fitzherbert, because it was illegal for a Protestant British monarch to be married to a Catholic twice widowed commoner, the prince's father, George III, forbade the couple to marry. But as most desperate lovers do, they went ahead and got married in secret anyway, after secretly exchanging their lover eye portraits. But it didn't last long as King George III declared the marriage invalid and forced the prince to marry his first cousin, Caroline of Brunswick. The prince's scandalous marriage and the lover's eye portrait he exchanged with Mrs. Fitzherbert didn't start the trend, but it did make it very fashionable to wear a secret lover's eye for 40 romantic years. 
It was when photography came into the picture that the trend faded away in favor of carrying true-to-life tin-type photos of a loved one instead. The largest collection still in existence can be seen in the northeast of the United States at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, the Philadelphia Museum of Art, Boston's Museum of Fine Arts, and in London, England at the Victoria and Albert Museum. When you lay down color, think of it as tissue paper. Every layer should be light and airy because watercolor is very unforgiving. What I want to do now is make a color that's a little darker than this and start painting in the next darkest color. I'm going to use a little yellow. In this instance, I am using medium yellow. So I will have a list in the description below of all the colors I use. They're not all the same brand. I just use what I have and um, I do not use the most expensive or the cheapest. I use somewhere in the middle always um, because that's within my budget. I'm trying right now to mix a color comparable to some of these darker shadows until I'm happy. And you can test your colors. Do not test your colors directly on your painting. Put them to the side, get a good idea of how it's gonna look even better. Wait for it to dry so you know what it looks like when it's dry. But right now I'm going to go with this because I'm happy with that color. And now I'm putting in these colors and then I'll work in these. And again, this is all just a layering process. I know that this is much darker than this, but I'm still going to use this I'm still going to fill in that area. I am just going to go back again later and add other colors and make it even darker. But again, think of it as layering tissue paper over tissue paper over tissue paper. Remember to leave your lightest lights. Now working in this small, really small, size is not an easy thing but again like I said I love the idea of a lover's eye portrait and since I love my husband I thought it would be a wonderful thing to try to do and uh, make it into a brooch that I can actually wear now I'm removing some color where I think it's a little bit too dark and I want to leave the highlights I could always always go back in later and add more color try to get if it gets too dark while you're painting and it's still wet just lift the paint with your brush now I'm using a fairly large brush at this time when I go in later to do details of course the size of my brush is going to de decrease I'm going to use a much finer brush but I see these little highlights right there and I want to preserve those. So I'm backing off on color. It might seem like um, unnecessary details, but in the end, it makes all the difference. You'll see. Now I'm going to start with a darker color. And how I'm going to do that is I'm going to add just a little more of the red. And a little bit more of the yellow. And then, believe it or not, I'm going to just add a dip of blue. 
Now you see how it made a brown. It's a grayish brown because of the blue, but it still has enough of a warm tone to it. And again, I'm not just going to put it right onto the painting, I'm going to test it. Now that's a little too dark. For now, that's a color I could use later, but for now, it's much too dark. And I think I'm going to go down a size in my brush. Now my brushes are not expensive. I am the person that buys the deal at Michael's or Joann's. Now this is, like I said, is a little too brown, so I'm going to lighten it up a little with more with the flesh tone. There we go. That's more of what I was looking for. Okay. And if I step all over my words, please forgive me. I am actually a very quiet person. So to do this is a little bit odd for me to speak while I'm working. I'm usually working alone here in my studio with nobody to talk to, usually with a uh, audio book on in my ears. But today I'm talking to you and happy to do it just a little bit odd for me. And I hope that uh, you don't find it that irritating. Find me uh, less than desirable to listen to. I do have a New York accent. That's where I'm from, Long Island, New York. And I know I keep stopping to talk because I'm focused and concentrating. If I was doing something a less uh, a little less personal or a little bit less detailed, I'd be speaking a little bit more. But you, you'll see that in further videos where maybe we do something a little bit more lighthearted. Again, I'm lifting up color, cleaning off the brush. Use even the water sparingly. Everything done in watercolor is done sparingly, unless you are a bold, doing a large, bold, work, then go all out and allow those hard edges to define your artwork. But if that's not what you want, especially on something like this, you, uh, you have to work very lightly and in layer upon layer. It takes a lot of patience. I can tell you that. Like right now I'm looking at here along his eye, it's lighter. So I'm going to lift that. I don't like how it looks. So I'll just keep trying to lift it a little bit at a time. Patience. That's what it's all about. I am painting in the shading more than anything. I'm going to take my bigger brush because I didn't like how that didn't lift. There we go. Again, sometimes you have to go back to the bigger brush because it'll lift more. And this, I see, is getting hard. And there we go. It's gone. Okay, now what I'm doing is giving it a little bit of a dry. It helps speed up the drying process. And now I can do what I would consider another layer of tissue over the old layer. Okay, it's a little damp for what I want to do. So I do a little blotting with a very clean side. And if it blots a lot of stuff off, I'm not worried about that because I could always add it again. Always can add it again, can't always lift it up. So right now this crease bothering the heck out of me. So I'm going to go in and I'm going to put that shadow that defines it in now so it could stop bothering me. Pulling motion, especially with a curve, always do a pulling motion. Don't go like this. Well, I shouldn't say don't go that way. If that's what works for you, that's what works for you. Again, I'm all about what works for the per individual. Now I'm just defining the upper lash of his eye. We will go back and make that even darker. OK, 
Okay, right now, what I want to do is I want to go in and do some coloring on the eye. Now, obviously, the um, center of your eye is black. It appears black, but I don't ever do anything just completely black. Um, that's way too stark. It just doesn't look natural. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a little bit of black and add a tad bit of blue to it so that it doesn't look stark against the blue eye once I do the eye. But you know what? I did that in the wrong order. See, you always got to be thinking. That's the thing about watercolor. You have to be thinking one step ahead of yourself. You have to be planning. Number one, do not go over that white circle there because that's your highlight. Number two, do the blue, under blue first so that you could do the darker color over it. If you try to do it the other way and you do the dark first, which was what I was about to do, you're going to bleed that black and it's just gonna ruin the whole eye. So first, lighter colors first, darker colors after. Now, I'm gonna go with this pure blue. Oh, by the way, these this small little palette you can get like four or five of them for a dollar. Well, now a dollar twenty-five in Dollar Tree. That's where I got it. Works perfect for watercolors. Oh, and I also bought this in Dollar Tree. This is an egg container, and I use it for acrylics now. I mean, for a dollar twenty-five, instead of going and buying an expensive watercolor or acrylic palette, works perfect for me. Put your colors in here. Mix your colors here or mix them in each individual one. It's fabulous, it works perfect. Okay, back to this. All right, now I'm gonna put down some just pure blue in Andrew's eye. Just so I can, at this point, get down a base layer. As you see, leaving that little wh white alone. And I'm just gonna let this dry because right now, that's all we want. We want it to just dry as it is. Okay, I'm gonna go back to doing the rest of the eye, doing a few more details with this darker brown now, because the eye here is blue, the blue eye is very wet, I'm going to leave it alone. I'm not gonna go anywhere near it, because if I do, whatever I'm doing with the brown is gonna bleed right into that eye, and that's the exact opposite of what we want. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna accent right here the lash line and start building up these darker colors. And I have a line here. I don't know if you can see it. I have a very faint line of the lash line. Okay. And, and now I'm going to be quiet for a little while while I do this and, uh, if you have any questions, if I forget to tell you something and you have any questions about what it is that I'm doing each step, please leave comments. I'd be happy to answer anything you have to ask. Um, but, okay. So now I'm ready to do a little bit more in the inner eye around the iris. So I'm gonna do a little phthalo blue going to add that to this blue. Now that's the thing about watercolor. You use, for something this small, you end up putting way more paint on your palette than you would expect to use. But you know what? With watercolor, it never goes bad. It, uh, even if it dries out, you can still use it. So never worry about that. Once it dries out, it could always be revived with more water. 
I wanted to go over one thing that uh, a lot of artists do not do, and some do. I do not use black for shadows. I have never used black for shadows. What I do is I use, because under your skin, there is blue. There are blue veins. There are blue, there's a lot of blue under there, a lot of purple. So what I use for shadows, for the most part, are shades of blue, purple, and occasionally brown, depending on where I'm working on. But even though I was putting all this brown down around the eye, which you can see as it dried, got very, very light. So again, we're gonna go back in and uh, darken some of the areas. But um, I use blue mixed with a little of the flesh for shadows. Sorry, black makes no sense to use as a shadow. See, now to me, that's a brown shadowy color with a blue undertone, which is what you would find on a human being. Now if here, I'll put some black next to it. And that's just, let's leave and lighten it. Obviously it needs to be much lighter if it's a shadow. I know we use black as shadows in uh, digital art in Photoshop. I, I am a digital artist as well. It's just so colorless, so lifeless. It's there, I like it, it's okay but it's not what I would use for human human skin. I would use it on buildings or, well, actually I wouldn't even need to do that. I use a very little black. There are some artists, um, professional artists that have don't even buy black tubes. So anyway, I'm gonna use this mixture of the flesh tone with a little bit of the phthalo blue added to it. And I'm gonna use that for shadows. So now I'm gonna go back in, put some deeper shadows in. And right here, I'm gonna do right here, this brow bone into the nose. That needs some serious shadow. Comes to a peak right here. Oh, see now, I see now doing this, I can see where I went wrong with this line. I have it out too far, it should be over here. So again, correct yourself, if you come across something that's just not working and study it try to figure out why it's not working and don't get frustrated because you will figure it out I'm going to put a little bit underneath where the brows are going to be but I'm gonna soften that up. There we go, soften it up. There is a point, a saturation point with watercolors where too much water, too much working it, overworking it, will just raise the pulp of the paper, which it's kind of doing over here and I'm not liking that too much because I've gone over that area way too many times. In a larger portrait, that wouldn't happen. And the whole my whole picture is getting a little too dark and I'm just not happy with that. So I'm gonna pull a little more water, bring a little more water on here and pull a little bit more off. Okay, I'm gonna come now and I'm gonna go back into this area and fix this line. This line here, I had it going out too far. So I'm gonna take a little bit of that shadow with a fine brush, and I'm not gonna go anywhere near this part, which is still drying. And I'm going to, oh, see, you know, I think that's too thick, that brush. So. I'm gonna go in with a much finer brush. What do we have here? Here we go. This is a 10-0. 
very fine, super, super fine. I don't know if you can see that. Anybody can see that. But that's what you want when you're doing something as fine as this, when you do the details. Oh, don't keep your brushes in the water. I don't know if you've noticed what I've been doing is when I dump, I put water, I dump, dunk into the water, I always go like this. What a fine point you get. That's what you want. Just go like that. Roll it out. Roll it out. Do it with this one too. Put it in. Tap off the water. Roll it out. And you got a nice fine tip. Now we're going to do this one. This one especially. Look how fine that is. That's like the head of a pin, which is what you need in something like this. So that's what I'm going to use now going forward to do all the. I'm going to go this way because remember, pull out, pull out, pull towards you. For me, that's what works. Now, I'm going to even change this and move this into position with me so I can see exactly what I'm doing. I want to make this line, but I have to bring this part of it forward. I had it out too far. There we go. That's correct. Now I'm going to stay out of this area because that's still drying. That big puddle is still drying. And I'm just going to keep adding. Okay. Now that makes more sense. I'm going to lighten it up. Start adding some life into this with a little bit of red. Or what color is this? This is crimson. So we're gonna add a little bit of crimson red to bring some life into this eye so that he doesn't look like he's a zombie that's been dead for weeks on end. And just add it wherever we need to add some life. Now, definitely need it here. And I'm just going to dab it. At this point, dab. Don't brush because you're just going to upset whatever you did before. Here we have preserved a little of that. Now I'm hoping that this all dries much lighter than it appears. Now this line, that lash line, that's got to go. That heavy, hard line. Yeah, he's got lashes, but he's a boy. He's not a girl. So we don't, for men, we kind of want to soften that line. We don't want him to look like he had guy liner on. Because trust me, my husband's never had guy liner on. Anyway, so soften, soften, soften. And if you're wondering, I preserved those two white. I'm going to go back in and erase those little lines that are around the white. It's going to be a very um, light job because if you erase too hard, you actually will lift up some of the watercolor. But I will not do that until the watercolor is completely 100% dry. This paper is going to have to be completely dry before you try even attempt to lift up color. I mean, uh, the pencil. So, okay, I'm going, I'm going to stop, stop futzing with the coloring around his eye. I'm going to let it dry, then I will go back in with my super fine 10, 0, and then I will do a few more um, details on it, but until then, I'm going to work on the eye, the iris. Okay, now, put another layer, I don't know if you guys are even seeing what I'm doing here, because... I guess you, you would know from my channel this is all new to me. Okay, um, here we go. Putting another layer of blue. Just 
bringing up that color. Now while it's wet, I'm going to go in with some of the phthalo blue, the darker blue. Let's see what we do. See how this works out. If we, and I always make sure it's heavily watered. I don't want it to be full on pigment. That won't help us out at all. Oh, see how it just, whoop. but I kind of like that because it preserved where I did not get close to where the black part of the eye is. It left a, very, a tad bit of light blue. Kind of like that. I'm gonna put a little bit more life back in like I did earlier. Just with some crimson. What I want to do is on the white of the eye, by the way, okay, I'm just adding this blue to the eye to close up that space because apparently Andrew was looking to the side, much more to the side than I realized. And we'll make up for that over here. But while I'm doing that, I'm gonna pull a little bit of this blue. Oh shoot, it went into there, see? Patience, people, patience. I have no patience. Okay. I wanna pull a little of this blue as a shadow underneath the lid. It, it has a, a way of making, bringing out that curvature. He looks a little bit more alive now, which is good. I'm gonna start working on the eyeball only. And I think I'm gonna use the really fine brush to do this. Really fine brush because I want to move out um, the color of his, the, his, of his uh, pupil, the iris, I'm sorry. Pupil's the dark part, right? Yes, iris is the pretty part. Okay, so I am going over here. That's not dark enough. I'm gonna go and bring the iris over here. take a little bit of this shadow color that I was using earlier and a little more blue to it. Get it in the same color family. There we go. Let's get it in a bluish brown. Let's see what that looks like. A little more blue. A lot more blue, I guess, right? So it's more of a teal. Color is everything, isn't it? Oh, too much. Sometimes, and that's because I'm using this little brush and that just doesn't work. I'm making a mess. Okay. 
let's put that in. Just keep mixing until you get the right color because this is not working for me. That's actually more what I was looking for. I was looking for a darker bluish color. Yes, I could have probably added black, but it's not the way I want it to go. I want it to keep with a color that, let's see. Yes, that's what I wanted. Okay. Now Andrew's eye is not that blue, which is what I'm trying to fix going to go nice outside ring because most eyes have that turn this around so I can do a pulling motion again on this side Ooh, too much too much Let's see how that looks now this I did too much so we're going to pull a little of this back. Now let me tell you something. There were certain watercolors that are staining watercolors. And this is one of them, Thalo Blue, which is what I was using. It has a tendency to, to work as a stain and it will actually stain the paper. But I'm not too bothered by it because it's working to my advantage as making this appear like ooh, sugar. See, I just added a whole dollop of water by mistake. Wasn't paying attention. Let's suck some of that up. Suck some of it up. I'm going to use this brush. And it, if I don't get it, it's going to start to bleed. Okay. See? You don't pick it up, dry the brush, put it over there, and it's gonna pick everything up. I keep moving the center of the eye. That's why the center of the eye is where it is. And let's go with this. See, it's blue, it's dark. Just going to leaving this a little bit of this bright blue. I'm gonna leave it, but I'm going to outline the eye. Staying away from that edge. Even with the finest brush, sometimes it just gets away from you. It just really does. It's what makes watercolor so difficult. Okay. And I'm just mixing it with this brighter blue to have a more realistic blue eye color. I didn't want it to be teal, because no one has teal eyes, especially Andrew. Ooh. I gotta darken it where I can. And I'm just now you see how this is a little bit lighter what I'm gonna do is let this dry mix it all around now but I'm gonna make it got to get into that little section I'm gonna add the black or the pupil last. Okay. And what I'm going to do now is lift a little bit of this color here and just a little dab there to give it some sparkle. Lift that. And I'm going to 
lift a little over here because I'm starting to lose the, the circular shape of the eyeball, of the uh, iris. Okay. Now, while that's drying, I'm going to go back and tr attempt the finest line I possibly can make of a fold of his eye. I'm going to go in and I'm going to mix a color that's a little brown. myself a nice brown color. Let's see. That's good. And I'm going to go and just lightly with the bare amount of paint. If you have to just back off some paint off the brush because puddles in this instance would not be a good thing. And I'm going to pull I see some hardness there, but I'm going to ignore it for now because to try to fix that right this minute would not be good. And I almost keep going into the wrong reservoir, wrong paint. Oh, see? Now I'm forced to fix it. Not even listening to myself. I'm telling you guys what to do, and I'm not even listening to myself. It's not good. Back off some of this. Keep cleaning the brush, rolling it, getting the water off. Clean your brush, roll it getting the most of the water off because otherwise you're just going to form more puddles. So now I'm going to go in and do the line at his top lash line. See how much paint we have. Don't want to puddle it. And it's just above. Ever so. Now I know he has lashes, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to do this merest, put a lot of water in this, I'm going to do the tiniest hint. Uh, I don't even know if they're going to show up, but of them. When they dry, they'll dry much lighter. And the same thing with the bottom. I just want to do the slightest indication.
back to the eye. I want to make this dark, a little darker around the iris. a little darker. And there we go. When that dries, I'm going to put in the pupil and uh, reflect a shadow of what's going on under the eye, which I think I'm going to add over here as well, as it reflects the color of the eye. better color than I was using with the brown. Okay. Now I know what I, I figured out what I am missing. I am missing <clears throat> this shading, which shows the roundness of the eyelid. And what I'm going to do, yes, I am going to futz. I am going to pull Add a little of this over where, because I wasn't liking those top lashes anyway. I'm going to put a little of this blue into this and use that as our shadow. giving it a little bit more dimension than it had, which is what I've been trying to do all this time, but it took me a while to figure out what it was that I was not doing correctly. And sometimes it does. Sometimes it takes you soften the knees. This whole thing and it's going to take a couple of layers in order to because I'm not doing this just straight on black remember I put a little blue into this what do you think Oh, you know what? I need a little red, a little pink at the corner of the eye. Just a tiny bit where those highlights are. There we go. Just the tiniest bit. Back in 
with that bluish black that I had created earlier. Move a little bit more black in it, a little more pigment, so we can get that rich black that first let me just lay it down like that it's amazing how putting the black pupil down brings the eye to life because I guess it's not really the iris that makes the difference. It's that deep, dark, black pupil that says, this is who I am. Not sure? What do you think? Am I done? Am I done futzing? Am I done playing? and overworking this piece, I think I am. I think I want to just stop now because I'm afraid that if I keep going and fixing all the things I'm looking at that I find completely wrong. Um, like this right here. Oh, I could just keep going all day. So um, I think I'm done. It's not really what I wanted, but it's not the worst thing I've ever done. Um, Oh God, I see so many things that need to be fixed. I see so much. Okay, I'm as done as I'm gonna be, I think. Oh, I just can't stop myself, it's just, it's just horrible. One of the hardest things about being an artist is, a hard, one of the hardest things about being an artist is knowing when to stop. Knowing when either the image has defeated you or the image is actually done because sometimes it isn't what you wanted. It wasn't, it isn't what you envisioned in your head. This is not what I envisioned in my head. Obviously it would have been more like this, but there's a point where the, the nothing you do is gonna fix it. So you just look at it, you figure out what it is you did wrong and then the next time you attempt the same thing, I mean, I can go back and do another eye. I could easily do that. Um, then I would know what not to do. This is completely overworked. That was my first mistake, is I was not trusting my initial laying down of color and I kept working it and working it and working it. And as you can see, it's just not as light and airy as it should be. But it's not horrible. It's not the worst thing I've ever done. I mean, I see things like that corner should get a shadow, but I'm so afraid that I'm just going to bleed everything if I do that. And so I have to stop. Now, what I'm going to do now is wait for it to dry completely. And then I am going to go and place it into this and uh, you can watch me do that. It's got little spots for little, um, to put in little um, color for stones, which I do have, but I'm not sure I really wanna do that. It's not for Andrew's eye. And I'm gonna eventually put a back um, piece on there so that I can wear it as a brooch. So be back with this already. Okay, let's let this dry. Okay, now it's time to cut out the eye to place in the brooch. 
I'm just going to use regular tacky glue and I'm going to cut out the eye with a scissor. I could do it with an X-Acto knife, but you have to be a precision cutter with an X-Acto knife for it to work. I do much better with a small, very sharp scissor. you're going to do in order to use a scissor properly what you want to do is you want to move the paper not the scissor the correct way to do it is to move the paper as you come down up and down with the scissor don't do this it's awkward and you're not going to get a smooth I am just following that pencil line as much as I can see it. Not perfect. It would be great if I had one of those punch cutters in this exact size, but since I don't, this is my only option. If you go off course, just correct yourself the next time you go around. Oh, of course. And there you go. Now I see that this curve looks a little bit off than this curve, but the best way to tell, oh, it's much smaller than I thought it would be. But that's what it's gonna look like when it's in the frame. And I'm okay with that. Oh, I only see one little doohickey right here. That looks wrong. Gonna snip that. And there you go. Quite possible we could have used the next elliptical size up, but um, I'm always afraid that it would be too big. But there you go. So now let's glue that in. Now I haven't gone back in and gotten rid of those uh, pencil marks because I want this to dry overnight before I even attempt that. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to put the glue directly on lightly. You just remember to glue lightly. You don't want any more wet medium on here than you need to have. And I am a hand spreader. I don't use a brush. I do everything with my hands. Minimal amount of glue. Place it in here. I am a little bit off here, but you know what? That's fine. Then I'm going to press it down. I think I probably should have gone with a stronger adhesive. Let's see if this comes up easy. No, it's not coming up easy, so just keep pressing down the edge. Clean, dry hand, finger. Technically, technically, this should be under glass. Another thing I could do is pour resin over this to seal it. I have done resin work before with some of my prints, but I'm always afraid that it's going to destroy the artwork. A print, fine, I could always live with that, but not an original work. Okay, so there it is. 
Andrew's eye as a lover's eye portrait. Now I'm looking at it and my first tendency is to take this and do fine, more fine detail with colored pencil, sharp colored pencil. And I could do that. I could easily do that. But it's not the point of this painting. This was supposed to be a painting in the style of the uh, early 19th century. So we're going to keep it the way it is, just as it was done with love for Andrew. I hope you enjoyed this. If you have any comments or even advice for me, I'm not an expert. So if you guys have a better way of doing things or, um, or uh, if you are watercolor um, experts or, or experienced more than I am, please leave comments kindly sent, kindly meant. Please do not um, berate me for not being um, a first tier artist. I am um, a hobby artist. So this is what I do for fun. And as a hobby, I do not sell most of my art. I have art that could be sold, but I don't really sell my art. I do it for fun. And I thought this was a great idea to do. So if you have any comments, kindly meant, kindly sent, please leave them in the uh, comments below. And I will be happy to have a conversation with you about it. Thank you. Bye for now.